Hi, I'm Jim Cunningham, and today we're going to talk about business owners, how to stop overpaying on 401ks. These are things that business owners should be mindful of when it comes to 401ks. We have two great presenters. We're going to go over a lot of great content. Jeff Atwell, who's a principal at TRG, Fiduciary Services, and Christina Lindsay, who is a financial advisor at Ascent Wealth Management. So uh, before we get started, as we do with all of these, a disclosure, I'm a lawyer. I will be talking. This is not legal advice. Christina will be talking. Jeff will be talking. This is not financial advice. Okay. So don't just look at, watch this video and go out and start doing a bunch of stuff. Go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're watching this live, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. But certainly if you're watching this on YouTube, it's very easy to subscribe to our channel. Lots of changes happening this year with the whole Biden thing. Um, in fact, there was just another California labor law um, statute that was passed uh, that I heard about today about rehiring if you're in the restaurant industry, re rehiring people. So we're going to be covering a lot of uh, a lot of great topics on our YouTube page. But with that, Christina and Jeff, um, I'll let you take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Jim. And it's uh, great to be part of the, the meeting today. And uh, I look forward to sharing some thoughts with everyone. One of the things that uh, Christina and I really like to find out when we visit with a business owner about the retirement plan. And one thing that I've found very important over the years in working with uh, plan sponsors and business owners is finding out exactly what the goals and objectives are of the company that's wanting to sponsor a plan or that has a plan in order to enhance their plan so that it can be a significant employee benefit for their employees but at the same time be a great company benefit for the owners as well. So one of the things that we always have to take into account in, in looking at that is what type of business does the employer have? In other words, is it a C corporation? Is it an S corporation or an LLC? That's very important to know how those owners are paid and how they derive their compensation. Do they have any other related employers? Uh, there are specific rules uh, that have to be met in the Internal Revenue Code, dealing with uh, individuals that own multiple companies. And sometimes you have to combine those companies into one plan uh, so that they're not discriminatory in nature. And sometimes you don't. So uh, knowing uh, the ownership of all related employers is very, very important. Is there an existing retirement plan? If there is, uh, you know, what do the, owners of the company like about that retirement plan? What do they dislike about it? And of course, are there any family members that are working in the business with the owners of the company as well? So those are some of the key factors in, in helping design a plan to meet the business owner's goals and objectives, which is very, very important. And then also as time goes on, making sure that this information is always updated because one thing that we can be assured of, Jim, over a period of time is that the regulations are going to change and business goals and objectives will change. So it's very important to keep all of this updated as time goes on as well. You know, as I'm listening to you, Jeff, um, in, in getting ready for our, uh, our time here today, I was really struck by, I mean, I, I really think that business leaders don't pay enough attention to this because I think this is something that can fall into the cracks between HR and finance. And, and many times, this is a function of HR. Somebody says, let's get a 401k. We need retention. Are we going through a payroll provider? Well, why don't we call them? Because that makes logical sense. So this is happening on the HR side. But really, this is something that the finance side of your business, right? Your controller, your CFO, uh, or the small business owner. I I'm, I'm don't think people pay enough attention to this, okay? And this is really important because there's also, we're going to cover here, a lot of downside. And there's a lot of risk that the employer uh, does take on uh, when, frankly, they're handling their employees' retirement plans. I mean, th their retirement savings. And so this is a high stakes game. This is a heavily regulated space. And you really do need to assemble a team. And I'm just not convinced it's enough to, to pass this off to your HR to say, oh, just go to our payroll provider and, and get one of them 401ks and just check the box. Okay. Yep. You, you're exactly right, Jim. And so we're going to definitely cover some of that and really where where the key difference is between a payroll provider and um, someone like TRG, that's a third-party administrator and a record keeper. So we're definitely gonna hit on those points. 
Um, but, um, you know, when is a payroll provider uh, a good um, use of having a 401k plan with them and when is it not? So we're going to, we're going to definitely get into that. So we're going to talk about just some basic, I'm going to have uh, Jeff just go through some basic provisions of a, of a plan. Hmm. You're exactly right, Jim. And, and so many plans that we come in contact with have been set up in the way that you just described. And, and it's so important uh, to really look under the hood and, and drill down deep so that a plan can really be utilized as we've talked about. And some of the things that we do to do that is we look at some basic plan provisions such as eligibility requirements. There are certain regulatory requirements that the Internal Revenue Code requires that we stick by, but also that we have some flexibility in there as well. And you know, one thing that I've noticed, uh, I've been working in this area for 40 years. And one of, one of the areas that I've really noticed here in the last few years is that to retain and attract employees, employers have really lowered their eligibility requirements uh, for new employees to be able to enter their plan. Um, that's very important. Uh, we used to see a lot of one-year service requirements uh, for uh, eligibility periods. Now we're seeing you know, 60 days, 90 days, or even less sometimes. So eligibility is important, but we do have some flexibility there. The definition of compensation that is defined in the plan document that is used to determine how much an employee can contribute or how much is allocated to a participant's account is very important. The Internal Revenue Service uh, publishes statistics and one of the key operational defects that they have found in when they've audited retirement plans is that plan sponsors have failed to comply with the definition of compensation in the plan document. And that's, that creates a lot of issues and so what we try to do is assist plan sponsors in defining the definition of compensation in their document in an, a way that they can administer. So many times uh, they may start excluding various forms of compensation such as bonuses, fringe benefits, and other types of, of uh, compensation an individual may receive, but their payroll department or their payroll system cannot easily accommodate those exclusions. And as a result, wrong information is paid to the third party administrator, which creates operational defects. Yeah. And when I hear things, and, and so I'm a lawyer in California and I'm running a law firm. When I hear things like the compensation isn't right and you're not basically paying people the right amount of money, if you are a business owner anywhere in the country, but especially in California, that should really set trigger in your mind as a business owner, that's a real risk. Okay. Because you have to pay, you know, if you don't pay people, you're subject to tremendous fines and penalties. So it's very important to get, get your comp straight. You're exactly right. And in designing a retirement plan, we want to make sure that the features that are chosen, such as eligibility and compensation and other plan design features, that the administrative team at the company can actually fulfill those requirements. And, and we, we, come across plans all the time and are engaged to correct operational defects that have occurred because the plan features were not were designed in a way that could not be physically administered by the company sponsoring the plan. What does top heavy mean? Top heavy is very important. And that is where more than 60% of the plan assets are allocated to the key employees of the company, which are generally the owners and highly paid officers of the company. Now, what happens when a plan becomes top heavy, that creates a funding oblig obligation for the owners of the company to make to the plan for the non highly compensated employees. So basically if the owners are putting too much into a retirement plan, they got to dig into their pocket and settle up with the less compensated people so you get a correct ratio, right? Is that what you're talking about? That's exactly right. Okay. Yep, and we're gonna talk about that on the, um, in some of the coming slides, but I will say, I wanna comment on that for a moment. And um, I, I'm surprised at how often, quite frankly, I still see top heavy plans and people that will, um, 
say I had to have, you know, higher net worth um, individuals that will say employees that will also say, I, I couldn't contribute the max to my 401k. I got a tax bill back because they don't have a safe harbor plan. And so we're going to talk about having a safe harbor plan. It's another thing that, um, you know, startup companies um, that are using a paychex or an ADP payroll provider, they will oftentimes um, not do a safe harbor design. And so they want to start a 401k because you go, gosh, I'm in order for, for hiring people, I have to order, have a 401k for my employees. So they'll have a 401k, but if they don't have a safe harbor design, then they will end up with a top heavy plan because only the higher compensated people, the business owners are going to be the ones contributing the max. And if you don't have enough participation from the lower compensated employees, you're then going to be as an employer having to fork over extra compensation. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about these types of plans, Jeff, for a moment, and then let's talk about that safe harbor design. Mm -hmm. Exactly. As I mentioned earlier, I've been working in this area for a long time, and, and actually we have the best tax code that I've ever had to work with in designing a plan to meet a company's goals and objectives. And there's many different forms of plans that a company can adopt to accomplish that. And we start out with a basic profit sharing plan this is the original retirement plan that has been around for decades. And basically, uh, when these regulations were first written, a plan had to have, a company had to have current year profits or retained earnings to actually be able to make a contribution to a profit sharing plan, thus the title. However, many years ago, uh, that requirement went away. No longer do you have to have current year profits or retained earnings, but the plan, the name still stands as a profit sharing type of plan and which gives the company owners the flexibility of making contributions from one year to the next. So nothing is fixed, it's totally discretionary and contributions are made uh, and determined by the board of directors or owners of the company. And then in, 1980, in 1978, uh, the Internal Revenue Code added regulations uh, allowing for 401k deferrals to be added to a, for a profit sharing plan uh, document. So beginning in the early 80s, 401k plans started becoming popular, and this allows employees to make contributions to a plan on a pre-tax basis out of their compensation. And then, of course, in 2006, they added Roth provisions to the Internal Revenue Code so that a participant can uh, make deferrals either on a pre-tax basis or an after-tax Roth basis if the plan documents allow. Yeah, Jeff, can we just hit the pause button on the Roth 401k? I think this is very important to consider as a business owner. Many of your employees likely do not uh, itemize their deductions. If you rent uh, and you're a W-2 earner, you're probably going to take the standard deduction. So deducting from your payroll it doesn't really make sense on a traditional 401k. It makes sense to have a Roth 401k. And that, in our case, that was actually brought to my attention by one of our younger attorneys who's really into finance and, and wealth creation, just kind of as a hobby. And he said, Jim, we really need a Roth 401k. And that's just one example of, you know, I, I think you have to ask yourself, what is a retirement plan or what is, what is some type of employee benefit plan? What is it for? And who is it for? What's it for? I view it as probably number one employee retention. Okay, that's probably the single biggest uh, reason to have a a an employer sponsored retirement plan. But really, who's it for? It's for the owner. I mean, mm -hmm. right? Because retention goes to the bottom line. If you keep losing people, you're going to not make as much money. But if you uh, look at it from the what's it for and who's it for, this really is for the owner. And what we're going to do is we're going to as we go through this, we're kind of teeing this up. We will get to people are overpaying on their 401k and they're letting, you know, they're kind of leaving the back door open. But I think the Roth 401k needs to be looked at in, in the, the context of your employees who are not itemizing their deductions. They're taking the standard deduction on their 1040. It really makes economic sense for them to do a Roth 401k, right? Because that money comes out, by the way, the Roth 401k has no minimum distribution, which is really cool. And the money that you do take out of the Roth uh, is tax-free. Well, and the greatest thing that uh, needs to is 
understated is that um, you don't have an income limitation on contributing to a Roth 401k. Whereas there is an income limitation on contributing to a Roth IRA. So you can do a larger annual contribution because it's under the 401k code versus an IRA. And you can do so without any income limitations. So what really works well for our business owners, if um, they need the tax benefit, do, you know, put a little bit of money in the Roth 401k on your deferral. Um, at, on your on an after tax basis, and then take the tax deduction on the cash balance plan. So we're going to get into that in a moment. But mm -hmm. let's um, let's talk about the safe harbor design too, and some of the these next components. Mm. Okay. And then to kind of round out the different types of plans, uh, the money purchase pension plan uh, hasn't been utilized very much uh, in recent years uh, because of the rigidity and the contributions that are locked in the plan document. Uh, then we get into defined benefit pension plans or cash balance plans. We're gonna show you some great income tax planning strategies using these concepts. Historically, those plans have been used uh, by companies for pension and employee benefits. However, because of the tax laws that have changed over the years and because of the fact that uh, business owners need more flexibility and funding employee benefit plans uh, over the years. These have fallen out of favor solely as a benefit for just the employees, but we're gonna show you where they can be significant income tax planning strategies for you as a business owner when used it uh, properly. So we'll show you some illustrations here momentarily about that. So on the next slide, let's look at some of the contribution uh, limits as well as uh, the structure that Christina talked about uh, in regard to uh, safe harbor contributions and that sort of thing. So first of all, uh, we have our annual uh, contribution limit for individuals. And again, we have the highest limits that we've had to work with in years being 58,000 in an annual allocation for a, an individual uh, participating in a plan. And if they're over 50, that's an additional $6,500 for a total of 40, uh, let's see, 58, 64,500. So it's a substantial amount of money. Now the company, that's an individual less, uh, maximum. So the company can deduct for a defined contribution, which is a profit sharing 401k plan, 25% of their eligible compensation with a, ma a maximum per individual of $290,000 for an individual. So what we do, and we're gonna show you some illustrations here in a moment, is we take that 25% company contribution that can be made into the plan, and we try to skew that as much to the owners of the company uh, to give them the greatest amount of benefit possible under this allocation formula. And then if the company really is successful, it needs additional tax planning strategies, then we can layer on top of the, the 401k plan a defined benefit or cash balance plan uh, so that they can uh, really enhance their tax deductible contributions. And yeah, I mean, and, and in my view, a cash balance plan is, is like a super 401k. It's, it, it's a plan where you can put in a lot more money than that 58,000. And, and it's dependent on a lot of factors, but you know, you, you might 4x the amount of money that you can put in there. So it's, it's a needle mover if you're, if you're, you know, if you're making a lot of money as a business owner, and you're not spending it, which is kind of key, right? You know, you, <laughs> you, you have money left over at the end of the year. Uh, this is something I, I think that business owners should be looking at. They should be Absolutely. concerned. Exactly, that's right. And at the bottom of this slide, you see the different methods of allocation that can be adopted by an employer in allocating that profit sharing contribution. And as Christina pointed out earlier, you know, this is a big advantage of using a professional organization like TRG to design your plan and consult with you on the proper plan design compared to a, an organization that's going to just set up a retirement plan, a 401k, because you asked for it. They're not going to really give you uh, any type of consultation. <clears throat> what we do in working with, with, the, with you as a plan sponsor and around your goals and objectives, we, we will do plan design studies and that way you will be able to see how these different allocation methods can be utilized and which one is best for your company in order to meet your goals and objectives. 
That's exactly right. So, you know, in doing the, um, uh, working with an independent financial advisor is, is really critical. So if you're, if you're not working with an independent financial advisor, and, and I say that because whether it be just a, a payroll provider that you're saying, I just need a 401k for employee retention, I have to have one. You're not going to get custom plan design that really is looking at the best interest of the business owner and the employees and the types of employees that you have and your tax, tax uh, implications to the business owner uh, and to the business structure. And then I will say, you know, having an independent certified financial planner that really is coordinating with your um, plan design, record keeper, third party administrator, and also your CPA, if you don't have coordination on all those fronts, you probably don't have a plan that's meeting all the needs. And working with a, um, a uh, wirehouse advisor like an Edward Jones or a Merrill Lynch or UBS or uh, Charles Schwab or Fidelity, there is an internal conflict of interest. Um, they typically will provide proprietary types of plans and they do not do sophisticated plan designs such as cash balance pen pension plans. Um, they just don't. So yeah. This is where we get into the overpayment. So I, I believe the statutory maximum is 3%. Is that correct? Like the most that you can charge on a retirement plan is 3%. As, as far as fees? Yeah. Well, actually I've seen them higher than that. And, and uh, the, the regulations state that the plan can only pay reasonable fees for the services being provided. Well, reasonable, when people say reasonable fees, it sounds like you might end up in court one day and you know, if it's a small plan, it's not a big deal. But the thing is, these things are like snowballs. They get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you've been paying, overpaying on fees for years and years and years, and you have someone in your organization who kind of figures it out, what happens? I mean, do you have to, you have to pay that money back into the retirement plan? If, if you've been overpaying unwittingly on fees, if they're not reasonable, do you, as the employer, do you have to contribute more money to the plan? You would, uh, and, that, and that's a great point, Jim, is the fact that if the business owner sponsoring the plan, and keep in mind that the, the individuals at the company that are responsible for the governance of the plan are the board of directors or owners of the company and the officers that have been placed in charge of governing the plan. So if there's not documentation on file to document that the compensation being paid, the fees being paid to the service providers is reasonable, then the business is going to be held responsible uh, from the DOL standpoint, the Department of Labor, and the company would be required to reimburse the plan, potentially up to six years, for that excessive compensation that was paid to those service providers out of those plan assets. So it's a huge potential liability, mm -hmm. uh, depending on how much has been paid. Which goes to the point of don't overpay for your 401k, because that's, if, if you got it, if you've been overpaying on fees, those are gone. And now you got to come up with more money out of your pocket. It's like you're paying twice. Exactly. Yeah, so let's go to some of the next couple slides. We're going to hit on that too, in a little bit of greater detail. Um, and so what we really want to talk about too, is why it's important to have a safe Harbor. If you're not going to do profit sharing in particular, even if you are, um, but you know, so that you don't have a top heavy plan, you can do just a safe Harbor where you're matching for, and it's basically works out to be about a 4% match. So if the employees are putting in one, you're putting in one. If you're putting in two, you're putting in two. And as long as you do that across the board, you, you eliminate a lot of the testing needs of the plan so that you don't have those surprises at the end of the year that either you take your money back out or you then go and um, have to contribute on behalf of employees. So, so let, me, let me just kind of throw out an example. If the employees are bugging the owner, hey, we need a 401k, okay? Or HR says, we need a 401k. And the owner says, I don't really want to do a 401k. So call up our payroll people and check that box. But there's no way that I'm making any more contribution to the 401k. Those employees are on their own. If they want to put in one or two or 3% or whatever it is, that's on them. But I'm not putting a single dollar in. 
that's a problem, right? It's a huge problem, Jim, and I'm glad you brought that point up. In fact, I will not set up a retirement plan if an employer has that type of attitude. And the reason why is because it will be a disaster. In fact, I'm terminating two plans that was established probably three or four years ago, and the employer has never made a, a, a contribution. The owners of the company have been prohibited from making hardly any contributions because the employees never really made much of a deferral and they were total disaster. So at this stage, if an employer is not willing to make some type of matching contribution, especially a safe harbor match, then I suggest that they establish a payroll deduction IRA program and not even go down the path of a 401k plan because it will be a disaster in the long run. Yeah, and, and this is the benefit, you know, as and just kind of looking on a high level, this is important stuff, okay? We don't pay enough attention to it as business owners. And if if the business, if the business owner says, this is what I'm willing to do, if you just start checking a box, that may be the wrong box to check. So you need somebody with the brain like yourself behind all of this saying, well, if this is what you want to do, then don't do a profit sharing 401k plan, do some other type of plan, right? right? If, if you don't want to make any contribution. Exactly. Yep. Because they will be very disappointed. There'll be compliance issues as Chris pointed out. And, and uh, it, it really uh, creates a, a lot of distaste in the owner's uh, minds in, in regard to retirement plans. And so, uh, we really think that it's very beneficial, not only for the owners, but also for the employees to have a properly designed plan. And here are the basic sources of contributions that can flow into a, a profit sharing 401k. The first being, of course, the employee salary deferral. And we've mentioned those maximums earlier. And then for those employees who make a salary deferral, they will receive an employer match and again, we really encourage uh, the safe harbor features to be used. Uh, the first, the basic safe harbor is 100% of the first three and 50% of the next 2% so that the employer exposure from a financial standpoint is capped at a maximum of 4% of an employee's pay if someone contributes 5% or more. But then also if we use automatic enrollment, um, then we can have a different matching formula, which lowers the maximum exposure from 4% to three and a half. And also if we design that automatic enrollment feature correctly, we can even have a vesting schedule associated with that safe harbor contribution. The other safe harbor match, the basic safe harbor match has to be 100% vested at all times when it's contributed to the plan. However, if we've properly designed a safe harbor plan using this, uh, optional formula here, it can actually be subject to a two-year vesting schedule. So if a company has a lot of turnover in the first two years, then those matching contributions that were made to the plan would be forfeited by those employees who leave. You know, and, and as you're talking about this, I'm thinking with, with our, in our law firm, our business clients, you know, we have a range of, of business owners. If you own a McDonald's, and you've got uh, you're cycling through a lot of people, and the tenure there is is relatively short. That's different than maybe running a professional services practice, where these people oftentimes stick around for many many years. They have a, a, typically a higher level of compensation. They probably skew older. So these are all highly relevant facts, and this is why engaging a professional such as yourself, Jeff, and Christina, it makes sense because I I'm listening to you guys, and this is so esoteric and so out there. Um, you know, if you're making widgets, you look at this and you go, this is nuts. I mean, I, I, I'm not following this, right? But you, get, you gotta get the right team together and don't just rely on checking a box at some payroll provider. I mean, if there's, that's kind of the basic point of this whole, um, you know, this webinar here today is, is put some thought behind this because it is really important. Exactly. And, and I wanna just, uh, close this uh, segment with one key thought for everybody to think about. And, and that is think about a retirement plan as you would any of, of the other professional services that you might engage, such as hiring you, Jim, as their attorney or hiring a CPA if you're going to outsource your accounting. 
A retirement plan, think of this, a retirement plan deals with the Internal Revenue Code, which is tax law and governed by the IRS. It deals with the Employer Retirement Income Security Act, which is the law governing and protecting the rights of participants and beneficiaries, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, in deeper uh, content here in a moment. That's governed by the Department of Labor. And then it has a legal plan document. So I would venture to say that a retirement plan is a professional service, just like any other legal or accounting service an employer may engage for other professional services. And it should be handled as such and not as a commodity um, like a lot of, a lot of uh, plan sponsors uh, look at it as. So let's look at the, the cash balance plan. Christina, you've, I think you've had a lot of experience in this area working with plan sponsors. Uh, would you like to share some of your uh, experiences that you've had with some of your clients in this regard? I think she might be frozen. It looks like it, yeah. Yeah. So cash balance plans, It's uh, these are wonderful tax planning strategies. They're used more for this purpose rather than an employee benefit. Um, there, it's a hybrid plan between a, a defined benefit pension plan and a defined contribution plan. The main reason why these types of plans have gained in such popular popularity the last few years is it doesn't create an unfunded liability like a defined benefit pension plan. It does have a funding requirement because it is a pension plan, but it doesn't create an unfunded liability like a pension plan. Uh, does like a defined benefit pension plan. So, so it's, a, it's a pay as you go and you're not owing something at the end of a term is, is essentially yes. it. So if, you, if you're flush for a few years, say five years, you know you're gonna, your business is going to do well for five years and you're thinking about spending more time in Cabo than you're spending <laughs> in the US uh, and you've got that time horizon, uh, that's, that's a good time. And also, even if you're younger, it's a good idea to do it. So how much can you put in here, Christina? What's the yeah, so um, the qualified, you know, cash balance plan is is really where this caters to high income earning business owners, in particular, business owners that don't have a lot of non owner highly compensated employees. Um, if, if you have a lot of highly compensated employees. Um, it may or may not be a, a suitable plan for you, but if you um, have a lot of um, non highly comped employees. And as long as you don't have a lot of employees that are um, over 55, then this typically is a really good plan for business owners. And I say over 55, because keep in mind, if we take a step back, there's the, the key difference between a 401k, just having a, a, a simple 401k safe harbor plan, that is defining a contribution set by the IRS every year. So you have a defined contribution. If you're over 50, you can only put in 26,000 of deferral every year. On a defined benefit, you're defining a benefit that will be there at retirement age. And it's an actuarial you know, calculation that's done based on compensation and what this balance and bucket of money will be, assuming at age 65. So the closer you are to age 65, and if you're just starting a new plan, you've got this huge bucket of money that you can put in that will be there as your future benefit. So the older the employees are, the closer you are to that retirement age, the more funding obligation you have. So that's really where, you know, if you if you have a lower compensated um, employee base that's over 55, it may still work out fine for the business owners, but you are going to have a greater obligation to fill this bucket the older the employees are. But most of our clients, even if the owners in particular, if the owners are in their you know, mid fifties, all of a sudden you're making you know, great money. You don't have to send kids to college anymore. You've got a lot of income. You're in a high tax bracket. You've got this huge funding um, bucket that you can put towards your own benefit because you're older and closer towards that retirement date. So let's talk a bit about cash balance plans, but this is really where you do need an actuary to do those calculations. And so we're gonna go through an example here um, of a couple scenarios, but this is just showing the, the key differential between 401k only. You know, If you've got under 50, you can only do 19,500 
over 50, you can do 26,000 of deferral, or you can do that in an after-tax basis on a Roth. Then if you do profit sharing, um, you're limited on how much profit sharing you can do. Again, that goes back to that 58,000 cap that Jeff was talking about or over 50, 64, five. With a cash balance plan, you can do significantly more. And so you're really looking at a greater figure. And in California, when you're looking at over 50% between state and federal highest tax bracket, this allows you to get some pretty hefty numbers on a pre-tax basis. So this is just kind of a base case scenario, but let's walk through an actual client scenario. And that's on this next slide here, which is one of my clients. And I've blacked out the names and the the dates of birth and the name of the company. So um, I know that this is a lot, a lot of numbers, but I wanted to give you an example of probably my average business owner client. And I would say that this is a lot of our clients, Jim, that we work with. Yeah. And so we've got a husband and wife, we've got all the ages here, their husband and wife are 50, 50 owners gross compensation we put we didn't even take it to the max we did we could have gone more on their compensation to increase this funding in coordination with their cpa we determined this was the best funding for them this is their employee makeup so they do have a couple employees that are 55 and um and and older but not highly compensated so you separate the highly compensated from the non-highly compensated and what you can see here is you know, deferrals are deferrals. Anyone can defer as much of their income. So I don't really want to focus on that percentage of benefit to owners because that's just simply based on what you take of your income and defer. The cash balance plan, though, if you take a look here, there is an obligation to fund for employees. Um, but 92% of the benefit goes towards the owners. So of the $176,000 cash balance um, total at the bottom of this that has to go towards the cash balance plan, that portion, 92% of it's a benefit to the owners and it, that will eventually basically become an IRA for them at retirement. But this is gonna sit in a cash balance pension plan. This 176,000 is a deduction to the corporation and then of that, the overwhelming majority is a benefit directly to the owners. Then you have the safe harbor match, which is just what you would have essentially in any uh, normal uh, 401k safe harbor plan. So that's, you know, if we take a step back there, Jim, we can say that that's more, right. um, <laughs> that's more evenly uh, distributed. So that's one of the things is in a 401k, you can't discriminate, which is why, you know, a lot of people do safe harbor plans so that you're not dealing with, um, top heavy requirements or anything like that, you're dealing with more equal um, distribution of matching contributions on the safe harbor side. So that's where you see there's no discrimination uh, in a 401k. On the cash balance plan, that can be somewhat um, more discriminatory towards the business owners. And so that is really a business owner driven plan profit sharing. Um, typically the owners receive zero benefits. So that way you can skew the benefit on the cash balance side. So on the profit sharing, you see hundred percent of that benefit going towards the employees. Now let's talk about that for a moment as a business owner, the profit sharing and the cash balance both have vesting schedules. These are really great employee retention tools. So um, on the profit sharing, that's typically done on a two to six year vesting schedule where um, each year 20% vests after two years. And so then on the cash balance side, it's a three year cliff vesting for most of our clients. We can design this and customize it based on the employer's needs. But most of the time that cash balance benefit that's allocated to employees will not vest until three years. And so this is a great employee retention tool on the cash balance side. There's also a lot more investment flexibility. That is a pooled investment account. So oftentimes if you have your 401k and your profit sharing over here, you're allocating as an employee and an employer what fund choices you want those in. But the business owner, they do have a fiduciary obligation to make sure that that is being managed appropriately for the obligations. However, you can invest in a lot more different things in the cash balance side. 
And, and taking a look here at the bottom, what we can see is of the employer paid benefits. This is really where this becomes advantageous to the business owner. 73% of the benefits go towards the owners. Now, what I'm doing is I'm drawing what would otherwise go in taxes. Okay. So this is really important to understand. It's not what you make. It's they what keep. you keep. Okay. <laughs> so something to bear in mind is that, you know, the government is this weird partner in business. They make no capital contribution with the exception of PPP one and PPP two. Okay. I'll give them that, <laughs> but they make no capital contribution. And when it comes to profits, when it comes to profits, they're literally a, like a joint tenant on your bank account. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they, as we know, every year you kind of tally up, this was your income. These were your expenses. These are your profits. Then it's time to pay tax. And, and what I like about this here is when you look at the amount that's going in that would have otherwise gone to taxes, the owners are better off for having done this. Okay. Because this money is not going to the government. So this is just on a really high level. So for those of you who they say, well, you know, I'm doing my 50,000 a year or the 26,000, whatever it is, if you're um, maybe combined in this situation, the couple was able to do almost 40, 39,000 with their 401k, they can actually do an additional 163,000, which is kind of cool. And they're ahead of the game. But this is something that's really important to understand. You need to put this money in there. So if you're spending the money, right, and you don't have it at the end of the year, you're not going to be able to do this. So you need to be exercising some financial discipline. And one thing I will say is these types of plans give employers some degree of flexibility. And so I always say that we don't want to do a cash balance plan unless an owner has predictability of at least three of the next five years, continuing to have some continuity in their funding, minimum funding of a cash balance plan. We can always say, you know, I can design in this case scenario that we're looking at here, I can say to the CPA, give these two business owners a lower compensation so that their funding obligation goes down. We don't need that much tax benefit. And this is really where it comes into your financial advisor in your plan design has to be coordinated with your CPA. If there's no coordination, you're not getting proper service. Um, so we do want to make sure that there's some consistency in the funding and so that the IRS does not see this as a tax, you know, loophole per se. But what's nice about the profit sharing and the cash balance is that is not due until your corporate filing. So if we, if we decide to implement a plan in 2021, we're doing tax planning at the end of the year with your CPA, we're saying, okay, we really need to add a cash balance plan. We have to implement this, the plan documents by the end of the year for 2021, but your funding for 2021 is not due on the cash balance or the profit sharing or the safe harbor match until you file your corporate taxes. So you technically have, if you're on extension till September 15 of 2022 to plan for this. So you actually do have quite a bit of flexibility on when you fund it. So let's just talk about some other things here on being a fiduciary. So I think that this is important. Jeff, if you can just enlighten us on a few things as to why it is critical to have a fiduciary on a 401k plan. It is very critical. And, and over the years, there's been a lot of litigation by the Department of Labor as well as uh, legal plaintiff attorneys. And what they found is that a lot of plans have not followed proper fiduciary standards of care, but they had good intentions, but that doesn't protect against fiduciary violations. So, um, whenever you sponsor a retirement plan, as we talked about earlier, because the plan sponsor, the company, is named in the plan document as the named plan administrator, that means that the owners, the board of directors, and any officers or other employees that may have been engaged or delegated the responsibility of governing that plan become fiduciaries to the plan in the way it is governed. And so it's very important that they understand what their responsibilities are in serving in that capacity and that they understand what their service providers that they've engaged to provide services to them are providing to them in services. So let's look at the basic fiduciary code of conduct that applies to all retirement plans that are qualified 
in the United States. It doesn't matter how large or how small, everybody plays by the same rules. The first one is being loyal to the participants and beneficiaries. Very, very important. Every decision that is made in regard to the plan has to be made uh, for the benefit of those participants and beneficiaries that are covered by the plan. The investment should be properly diversified. So whether it's a participant directed plan or whether it's a trustee directed plan, such as a cash balance plan, those assets should be properly diversified and documentation uh, developed to prove that those investments are being monitored and selected on an ongoing basis. As we mentioned earlier, the plan should only incur reasonable expenses. Very, very important that the services that are being provided to the plan are necessary and that the compensation being paid to those service providers is reasonable. The Department of Labor will never define reasonable. And the reason why is because every single plan is different. Every company has different goals and objectives. What, they, what type of education they want for their participants, how frequently they want that education, the plan design. You have simple plan designs, you have complex plan designs. So the main thing is the responsible fiduciaries at the plan sponsor have to have documentation to prove that the compensation is reasonable for the services being provided. And in your experience, if, if I go to a payroll provider and I say, hey, we need one of those 401ks, mm -hmm. they name the employer as the fiduciary, right. very limited. Uh, you, got, you have a 401k, but I mean, if you think about it, what, what is a payroll provider in the business of doing? They're not in the business of administering retirement plans. They're in the business of making sure that people are paid correctly, right? And they get a lot of float. We had a question from Terry. Uh, Terry asks, in the cash balance plan, how are owners and employees over the age of 65 treated? That's a great question. And anybody over age 65 will continue to receive an allocation of contribution based on the formula that is in the cash balance plan, the retirement benefit formula. Now, whenever that individual, if they're a 5% or more owner, when they turn 72, they will have to continue to take required minimum distributions from that cash balance plan. However, they can continue to receive allocations to their account. So, but that only applies to an individual who's a 5% or more owner at age 72. If you're still employed at a company and over age 72, and you're not a 5% or more owner, you don't have to take required minimum distributions from the retirement plan. So, no matter what your age is, you will continue to accrue a benefit in the cash balance plan and therefore create a contribution requirement that the company- I mean, if you're over 65, I gotta tell you, maybe it's time to retire, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, do something else. Let the let the youngins take over, right? I've um, had, maybe it, I've maybe had, um, to, to, to have I've fun. had some clients that have some, um, especially when there's an age differential between spouses, I've had some clients that um, have kept working into 75 because they had such a large 401k and they did not want to have to take that RMT. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we do see that happen, but I know we want to kind of, for the sake of time, wrap up here in a yeah. couple of slides and, and um, Jeff, if you want to speak on this for a moment, and then I do want to highlight just a couple of key differentials on the payroll providers. <laughs> So as you can see at the top of the scale from a risk management standpoint, the, the fiduciary governance is very, very important. And as I've mentioned several times in our meeting today, the plan sponsor is the named administrator named in the plan document. Well, what that does is that means that the plan sponsor and the natural persons representing the company in that regard, which are the owners and officers of the company, then they're the responsible parties. When you look at a a plan document, you'll see in reference about 150 or more references to plan administrator uh, in the legal plan document that a plan sponsor adopts. And as you can imagine, anytime there's an indication uh, or a reference to that in the document, that means there's usually a duty associated with that. So they're responsible for the overall management of the plan. Yes, certain Services can be outsourced to third parties to help them fulfill those responsibilities. But because 
They are named in the document at the end of the day, if there's an operational defect or a fiduciary breach, those are the responsible parties that the IRS or Department of Labor are gonna to look to. That includes investment oversight. Now they can help protect themselves from any risk of litigation through purchasing insurance. Of course, ERISA requires that there be a bond equal to 10% of trust assets up to a maximum of $500,000. Uh, they also should have documentation. And as you can see, we've mentioned this several times, uh, documentation verifying that service providers fees are reasonable and necessary. Again, if that's not there, the Department of Labor can create some huge financial obligations for the company to, to uh, bring the plan into compliance with those regulatory requirements. Jeff, let me ask you, because you review a lot of these plans and, and, and part of, I think, the, the sort of next steps is to reach out to Christina and, and have your plan, have Christina take a look at your plan. How many of these people are, are missing that? I mean, how many of these plans are missing, uh, are, are missing that? that sort of documentation of reasonableness of fees? Is it 10%? Is it 90%? What, what do you see in the real world? Since 2012, when these disclosure rate and fee uh, disclosure regulations were implemented, um, I've been all over the United States. We have clients all over the country. I have found less than 10% of the plan sponsors that are in total compliance with this uh, exemption wow. that the Department of Labor has written that allows fees to be paid out of plan assets. You know, I will say as a lawyer, that one of the things that, that we do in my profession, we're very forward looking. And if there's a six year look back, I mean, look at how the world has changed in the last six years, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Obama was president six years ago. Yep. That was pre COVID. That's a totally different world. And something that's really important to understand for those of you who are watching this video is you are judged not on not by people who are living right now, but people who are living six years from now. Do you know what I mean? In a world six years from now. And they may look back and say, well, paying 3%, that was outrageous. They might say it's, it's reasonable. How much is reasonable, by the way? I know it varies, but just a ballpark, Christina. What, because um, if you're paying 3%, I'm sorry, that's a lot of money. Right. Yeah, I think, I mean, if, if you, you need to be close to 1%, I mean, I think this is reasonable. Um, and so here's the thing too, uh, and, and we'll kind of wrap up with this and just a, this, this in one last slide in just a moment. But um, when Jeff is also talking about the 338 fiduciary, one, why it's important to have that separation from it being the plan sponsor and the business owner or the CEO themselves serving as that fiduciary. You want a professional that lives this day in, day out, that's keeping in touch with the regulations. But another thing too, is when you just have, a, and I don't mean to pick on these guys, but you know, the big, the mutual fund companies, whether it be a John Hancock or whether it be a, a Vanguard, they have an inherent conflict of interest. A lot of times those internal fund expense expenditures, which is they may, you may not have a transparent fee that you're seeing on that 401k plan disclosure, but it's a hidden fee within the funds. That's how they're charging their fees. And then when you strip it down, they're about 1.3% a year on average, whether it be protective, whether it be principal, whether it be, you know, again, you name it, T-Row price, they're all inherently having a conflict of interest because they're putting their own funds in there. And when their own funds aren't the most competitive, you know, if you have this bond fund is not the most competitive internal expense ratio compared to the best performing, you know, lower cost top, top quartile of funds that are out there, there's a conflict. So you need an independent fiduciary to serve on the plan. So I can't emphasize that enough. It protects you as an employer. Um, and it also strips down the fees and makes sure that you're getting the best of what's out there. So um, what I kind of want to highlight here, because I know Jeff does work with TRG, but why I've used TRG and the retirement group in particular is I've worked with many third-party administrators. A lot of them are boutique firms. It's, a, it's an area of the industry that's getting a lot of consolidation. Um, they're, getting, they're getting bought and sold. There's not a lot of continuity. You have to have a, a, a third-party administrator that you know is going to be there. You want someone that you're going to have a dedicated client service coordinator that you're not getting a 1-800 number like you are when you call an ADP or paychecks. Um, an ADP or paychecks, they do payroll. They add on these extra 401k services as an add-on service, but you're not getting a, a, a plan level fiduciary. You're not getting open architecture. You're, you're not getting um, the option to do a cash balance plan. 
And so when you're really looking at that next level coordination for a business owner and tax planning, you're not going to get those things, the payroll provider. Now, TRG does have payroll integration where you can take your paychecks payroll and have that TRG can see what you're doing through payroll and upload that content. Um, they don't do payroll. Uh, you do get a dedicated service team. You do get someone looking at your plan design, looking at if you have high turnover, how can we look at changing the eligibility requirements? They're going to go through that and do a, a thorough review every year. But one of the key things is also open architecture. And Jeff, if you can just speak about what does open architecture really mean? That, that's a great question, uh, Christina. And what that means is that the 338 investment manager at the plan level has the entire universe of mutual funds, ETFs, and collective investment trusts to choose from in order to build the best investment lineup that your participants will have access to. And therefore, as time goes on and as different types of investments need to be considered and the investments that are being utilized in your plan replaced, then Landberg as your 338 investment manager and fiduciary can go to the entire universe rather than having a very limited universe, which is the case in most platforms and very limited a lot of times to proprietary investments, which are own investments owned by the record keeper providing the services for the plan, they have the entire universe. So not only is it give that 338 investment fiduciary a huge universe to choose from, but it's fully transparent. So there's not gonna be any hidden fees in regard to what the participants are paying from their plan assets. Everything is going to be fully transparent, which is very, very important to, in order to comply with those reasonableness of fees and the documentation associated with that, you've got to be able to evaluate and document who's getting paid from the plan. And this, in our platform, because it is open architecture, it does provide that transparency. Yes, I think we'll, we'll kind of wrap up essentially with this, but um, one of the things that a, a, a 338 and a plan record keeper should be doing um, in coordination with your financial advisor, um, and again, and your CPA, but the, uh, what TRG does for a lot of our clients is they, they have auto enrollment, they've got all of the safe harbor plan designs, they look at all the, they do all the testing, they do all the 5,500 filings, they do all the um, proper disclosures to keep you in compliance and providing all that information. So you asked in the beginning, Jim, you know, should your HR person be involved in this? Yes, they are going to need to be the ones also typically making sure that the proper disclosures are administered, that everything is, um, you know, the communication is getting out to the employees. However, this, you really need to have a business owner should be involved in their plan design and what's most tax efficient for them and is also good from an employee retention standpoint. So this really needs to be business owners, CEOs, CFOs, and HR can play a role. But um, you know the problem is oftentimes HR is just checking the box of, of having a 401k. Yeah. And that's oftentimes because you're dealing with a payroll provider. So this is where I think if we can do a thorough review for our business owners as to what is um, are they, do they have the best plan design? Do they have the layers of protection? Do they have the best in investment choices? A lot of times they just have mutual funds and target date funds. And, um, and, and really, are you getting what's best for you as a business owner that also accomplishes your goals for retirement? And I got to tell you, I mentioned this at the beginning. I think this falls through the cracks of finance and HR. I think it's something that uh, I think business owners really don't pay enough attention to. It may seem small, but it can bite you. Uh, and you guys may, frankly, you're watching us. You may be leaving a lot of money on the table. You may be overpaying your taxes. And I only have one client who wants to overpay his taxes. And we have lots and lots of clients over 25 years, only one client wanted to pay more taxes. So subscribe to our YouTube page. You can go ahead and, uh, you know, if you're watching this live, just go to YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube page. If you're watching this uh, recorded on YouTube, just go ahead and click subscribe. You can also write your, you know, we're going to open it up for questions. If you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and write your questions in the, the comments area. And we do monitor those and we do respond to those, uh, those questions. And we do have the links here. We'll put those links in the, um, in the YouTube notes. So there it's a, a quick hyperlink to, to reach out to us, 
But I think at this time, we just open it up for questions. And, you know, you guys did such an outstanding job. I mean, this is such an important, uh, an important part of keeping and retaining great people. And, you know, if you're in business and you're making widgets, you're in the widget business, but you're also in the people business, right? You got to attract the best and retain the best and having a robust um, retirement plan is, is in my view, it's just one of a basic offering that you have as a business. Okay. Uh, and in fact, Christina, I don't know if you want to talk about in California, if you have more than five employees and you don't do a retirement plan, what happens? That's one of the things I think Jeff enlightened us on that, uh, but there's going to be a state, um, a state sponsored retirement plan that um, you're going to have to have for your employees to, you know, your employees will have something to participate and you as an employer have to participate in that too. So it's kind of a, um, a way of forcing your, um, you as an employer, whether you're a small business and or not, if you have five employees or more, you really need to be looking at doing your own plan because I think we all know how California run, runs things from a financial standpoint and, and and having that as your option for employees or being forced to contribute to that is just not a good situation. Yeah, so let, let, let's just say this again. If you're a business owner and you do not have a 401k, you do not have a retirement plan in place, California mandates it and that is June of 2021 or 2022. This year. It's this year. So folks, you gotta pay attention to this, right? Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a gotcha and what you're, if you have not planned for this on your budgeting for and forecasting for the year, you're going to need to take a look at your budget because if you don't have something in place January, July 1, what happens? You're going to come under the state mandated plan. And what what are we supposed to do? Do we have to set? Do we have to tell our employees to go there? Do we have to put money in it? What's 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 happening with that? The employer will have to offer the plan to their employees. They are not gonna be required to make any employer contributions, only the employees. They have to make the plan available to their employees so that they can defer their compensation into a tax deferred retirement and, plan. And so what if you're, you know, you're running a business, it's you own it and you got five employees. It's a small business yeah. and you're not paying attention to this stuff and you don't do it. What happens? Then you're going to be found in violation. I don't know what the fine is, uh, but you will be found in violation of the mandatory uh, retirement plan regulation. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the fine is if you're in violation, but the state's going to come in and as if they're not showing up enough at our, our workplaces. <laughs> right, exactly. And my theory is now that you now that you're gonna have to have a retirement plan, let's have a good retirement plan, yeah. you know, because whenever you have to, if you elect to go under the state's plan, you're not gonna have Christina, you're not gonna have TRG providing services, you're not gonna have any consulting, you're not gonna have the services of Jim helping you as well. So you're not gonna have the the plan that you could have in the private sector, you know, and at the end of the day, whenever everything is said and done, our goal is not only for the owners to have a smile on their face when asked about the retirement plan, but also if we were to go out and ask the employees about their 401k retirement plan, that they would also have a smile on their face. And the only way that they're going to do that is if you have a good team working with you such as the one that we that has been visiting with you today. And uh, that's the most important thing is we want everybody to, at the end of the day, have a smile on their face if asked about their retirement plan. Well, Jeff, I think that's a great place to end. We don't have any questions. Again, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the YouTube uh, question box or the chat. But I think that brings us to a close today. Thank you all for watching uh, this webinar. And thank you, Jeff and Christina. Thank you. If you'd like a complimentary re review, we'll be happy to have your plan reviewed. So contact us at this information. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Thanks.